players. Everyone is having to innovate to stay in the game. Online has transformed the way we shop for food. All the food retailers are looking for new ways to get the edge on their competitors. They're battling it out to see who can make our grocery shop faster, more exciting and more value for money. So, with competition fiercer than ever, we're going behind the scenes with the country's biggest supermarkets <laughs> to find out how they're using the latest science and technology Magic. to stay ahead of their rivals. I'm Greg Wallace, and I've worked in the food industry all my life. I want to get fresh insights into the hidden ways the supermarkets use to produce our everyday products. And I'm Nikki Fox, a consumer journalist and one-time checkout assistant. I want to know about the tactics supermarkets use so that I can help us all become more savvy shoppers. This time, in an age when we expect everything delivered in an instant, how the supermarkets are fighting to bring us our food on demand. From using robots to revolutionize home delivery, this is truly beyond what human beings could do. Bringing a salad as soon as the sun shines. <laughs> this is fabulous. It's like a little factory in a field. That's it. Taking supermarkets straight to festival shoppers. There's actually quite a few hunters that say it's uh, one of the best uh, parts of the festival. And a checkout free future. Boom, job done. We're going to get the inside track on how the supermarkets produce our food. And what we find may change the way you shop. we can pretty well buy what we want whenever we want it and that's especially true for our groceries how and where we do our food shopping is changing a lot we now want food on the go morning noon and night and on demand has turned into a ferocious supermarket battleground the biggest on demand fight is over online delivery it's worth a staggering 11 billion pounds with around 175 million orders placed every year in the uk i'm heading to one of the depots that's revolutionizing online grocery shopping supermarkets are all fighting to get the edge over their competitors with their online delivery service and one claims to have built the most advanced facility in the world using robot technology to process our orders faster than ever before. This is Ocado's state-of-the-art delivery center in Andover, Hampshire, and it has a workforce of over 500 robots. Oh, I love them. The man behind this super-fast delivery system is Chief Technology Officer Paul Clark. Now look. You've obviously spent a lot of time designing this and a lot of money. Why have we got these washing machines running around? These robots, they're like a swarm. They help each other. The way to think about this is like a giant chessboard. And under every chess square is a stack of storage bins containing groceries. There are hundreds of thousands of bins beneath the robots, each containing only one kind of product. The robots can grab the bins using a hidden claw and pull them up inside. Then they put that bin down a chute to a packing station below, where the final order is assembled to go on to the customer. Right, hang on, hang on, hang on. So under every single individual square... Yeah, are it, stacks of bins, you know, 18 deep in this case. Um, and they, they literally lower grab, pick up the top bin, and if they want the second one down, they just can perhaps get one of their friends to go and grab that one out of the way, and then it can grab the one it wants. So they help each other. They're, they're, like, they're like swarms of insects. As each order comes in, an algorithm breaks it down into individual items and then allocates one or more robots to gather them. The team of robots can handle over 50 orders at the same time. There's an air traffic control system that's kind of moving all these things around. It's, it's working out the best robot to do a particular task. It's working out the best route for it to take. Eat 
each of the hundreds of robots travels nearly 150 miles a day, performing an elaborate precision ballet, whizzing past each other with millimeters to spare. I'm worried about them crashing. So if I order some cake decoration and these crash, that could cost the lives of hundreds and thousands. <laughs> so how long would it typically take to pick a 50 item order? Uh, literally a matter of minutes now. That's mind boggling. Well, especially when you're doing that across seven or 8,000 orders a day. So typical day, nearly 1,000 an hour? Yeah, this is truly beyond what human beings could do. But do any of these robots come into work and talk about the football the night before? Rarely in our experience. But this is only half the story. On the floor beneath, there are still humans, around 90 in total, packing the final orders. Are we, we now underneath? Yeah, we're in a tunnel that is all the way through un inside the hive with the robots moving around on top of us. And this is where we're dropping down those crates full of groceries and now they're being picked into customer orders uh, one by one. At the moment, the robots are only gathering the items needed. It's still the humans who take out the individual products and pack them. And that's because current robots can't pick up all the different shapes and sizes of products. But even here, the computers are in charge, deciding the most efficient packing order. We're taking a lot of care about the sequencing of what's being dropped down in order to make sure that the heavier items go at the bottom, that we don't end up with a, a smoothie as a result of crushing the, the strawberries. So, as long as the robot's instructions are followed to the letter, the human can pack efficiently. How many items are they doing, say, an hour here? We're doing about 200 items per person per hour and getting faster with every warehouse we build. Can yeah. I have a go? Of course you can. Off you go. Take me through it. With the system even telling me how to pack the order, I suspect even I can manage that. So that says what, n none of one? Yes, so, so, so far, far you have one. this. So first off, oh. we need to scan it first to find the barcode. There we go. One of one. And then the light will flash up. It'll tell and you that's in there. in there. Don't forget I'm to press this. the button. I'm loving this. What do you mean, <laughs> don't forget? Up comes a loaf of bread. Oh, it just wants me to put it on top of the bottles of drink. No, no, this one wants you to pop oh, it in this yeah, yeah, yeah. next to it so it doesn't get squashed. At least I questioned it, right? You didn't. I'm obviously not as fast as you. If I was as slow as this, someone's going to have a chat with me, right? They, I suppose they would suggest that you are a little bit slow. How long have you worked here? Um, just under a year now. Are you not frightened that you're going to lose your job? The technology is very good, but it should be a, hopefully a few years yet before the humans get pushed out. But it could come sooner than we think, because they're already looking at ways to bring us even faster deliveries. This is an experimental robot picker. We're using quite a simple suction uh, gripper at the moment, which can pick up quite an, uh, a range of different items, as you can see. The picking I was just doing, yep. you're going to eventually replace me with, with one of them? Well, not exactly with this, but uh, we're, we're, we have research projects creating other kinds of grippers that will go on the end, which are much more like human hands. Then we will be able to pick more and more items from the 50,000 different range. None of this new technology is cheap, though. It's cost Ocado hundreds of millions of pounds so far. But they're banking that all the minutes saved from each order will ultimately help them win the online delivery war. Paul, this stuff cannot be cheap. I mean, I'm only guessing at how much all this automation costs. Why are you spending this much money on more development? We're building lots of these warehouses. So once you've built the technology and written the software, Actually, re, you know, recreating it in a new warehouse is a lot less expensive. So this is an investment for the future. Ocado say this new technology is already paying off. They're now the UK's fastest growing supermarket. And their turnover has gone up by a third in three years to £1.6 billion. And their plan is to upgrade even more of their depots. Just minutes after the robots were into action, 
the orders are placed into vans and out for delivery. Driven, for now at least, by good old-fashioned humans. It's obvious that more and more of us want to do our food shopping online. It's definitely growing, and I am really impressed with the level of technology it takes to deliver it. Back there is a gang of very clever robots. More and more of us are being won over by the convenience of online food shopping. So, the physical stores are doing everything they can to keep us spending money with them. They want to make our in-store shopping trips quicker and easier. Perhaps the one thing that slows the whole shopping experience down more than anything else is queuing at the tills. But there's now new technology that might remove the need for checkouts altogether. Amazon recently opened a checkout free store in the US and now some UK supermarkets are dipping a cautious toe into scan, pay and go. Matthew Spate is Transformation Director at the Co-op. He believes using checkout free technology to speed up our shop is the future. Matthew, I quite fancy it up. OK. Show me how it works. Pop it in the bag. Delicious. If I hand that to you, do you yeah. want to carry that? Thank you. I'll of just course. Get this, uh, I'll get this scanned for you. So we'll just scan the item. So we've got it scanned. Yeah. Press checkout. Yeah. And there you go. And then we're walking out of here. And no queuing at the tills. That's it, we're done. When time's against you, lunchtime, evening meal, that's what this is for. And we don't necessarily see this being in every store. Yeah. We see this really for sort of city centre stores, probably primarily. So it is really for the, the customers wanting the wham bam, in, out, in, out. Yeah, in the urban stores, in the city centres, and where people are in a bit of a hurry, this is great as a tool. Yeah, because as a former checkout operator, I would miss it if there were no meal checkouts. Yeah, there will be checkouts yeah. and there will be a conversation, but yeah. I think the service is changing. The co-op is currently testing this technology in one of their city centre stores in Manchester. At this stage, they still need to be fully convinced that customers will use it and that it genuinely makes shopping quicker. So Matthew, I'm getting my lunch. How long is it going to take me if I use this app? I think probably, what, three minutes and you've been in and out? I'm disabled. I've never done anything quick in my life. Well, let's have a go. <laughs> so, should we try yeah, it? Yeah, let's give it a go. All right then. It's on. Race is on. Scan and go versus traditional checkout. First to buy a drink, a snack, and a sandwich. The easiest one to grab. Shortcut, let's find our way. I didn't scan them. Right, let me grab some of these. It's done. On to the drinks. I do you like that salad? Let's give it a slightly different one. Orange juice. And let's just grab a quick drink. Where's the barcode? Job done. Where's my sandwich? Right. Nicky's gonna beat me. There we go, boom, done, right, now, check out. After just two minutes, I'm done. That has got to be record. But Matthew's still queuing. Come on, come on. Taking your sweet time. It was so quick for me. And I never say that, I'm never quick. <laughs> I think, babe, I got that one. You did it. <laughs> there is no doubt. That is quick. I mean, I was just like, bam, bam, bam. For me, obviously, it was a little bit more difficult, but it is super speedy, and it's perfect for people who are in a rush, just want to get their lunch, want to get dinner, get back to the kids, whatever. You can totally see the advantage. But this technology has a big potential downside. It may lead to an increase in shoplifting. This does kind of require a lot of trust on your part, because I could have picked up another pastry and not scanned it and just gone off. The truth is with this technology is most of our customers come into store and they're, they're genuinely uh, wanting to do a shop and walk out. You yeah. know, most of our customers aren't looking to, to, to rob from the co-op. So you're not concerned about it? Well, we are, and we'll look to put some measures in place. So you can use cameras in a different way, uh, make them more visible, put a few more cameras in the stores. We've got some great technology in our higher um, sort of security risk stores, um, and it's really working for us. We've got people watching our stores remotely. Um, so that can really help alert colleagues. One thing that could immediately make us want products on demand is the weather. When the sun comes out, the first things we reach for are the ice creams, 
the barbecues and the cold drinks. And there's another product that really rockets in sales. A juicy barbecue burger or a crisp salad wouldn't be the same without this stuff, lettuce. And on a hot day, sales of this can go through the roof. But given the changeability of our weather, how on earth do the supermarkets manage to always have shelves full of the stuff? Nobody in Britain knows when the sun comes up. <laughs> You're absolutely right. How, how would you be if you came in for one and there wasn't one there? How would you feel? We're pretty gutted because you wanted one. Yeah. yeah. How do you know how many we're going to buy? There's some very clever people working behind the scenes. At m and it's Guy Grimshaw. His job is to make sure they avoid a major lettuce Hi, letdown. Hi, Greg. How are you doing? Traditionally, what would have happened? Either we'd go short, which meant uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have lettuce on the shelf, or we'd overbuy and therefore have an excess of, of, of lettuce. How would you have known how many you wanted? Historically, we, we, we would have relied on, on weather forecasts, but in recent years, those have become much more accurate. We're also now taking into account events such as bank holidays, World Cup, sporting events yeah. and bank holidays, yeah. they can bring about a rise in salad sales. But nothing brings about a rise in salad sales like the sunshine. That's right, yeah. The sun has a massive impact. So we can see a 300% increase from, from one day to the next. The sun comes out, everyone wants to get out for lettuce. In fact, sales of lettuce at M&S can vary from 30,000 to 150,000 a day, depending on the weather. And this is not a product that can be frozen or simply kept in a warehouse waiting for us. Lettuce, they take months to grow and they haven't got a very long shelf life, so they can't be easily stored. So how do the supermarkets and their suppliers make them available when we want them and fill the shelves at a moment's notice? I've come to G's, one of the UK's biggest lettuce growers. Jacob Kerwin is Precision Farming Manager. How much lettuce have you got here? So in East Anglia, we're farming over 300 million a year. No way. Yeah. Seriously? Up to that, yeah. But this huge crop of lettuces needs to be spread around the peaks and troughs of demand. So, to plan ahead, Jacob uses software that takes historical weather data combined with temperature data from sensors in the field. What we've got is a weather forecasting model that uses an algorithm, a forecasting algorithm, to say how much more we should sow based on increase in temperature. They also take into account previous sales data and events that will affect lettuce demand. All of this information is used to plan their planting across the year. We've been able to be more precise in the weeks that we need to sow more so that we don't sow more every week and we only sow more when we think we're going to have peaks in demand. But, as any gardener knows, the growing season doesn't always go according to plan. So, for an accurate assessment of exactly how many lettuce they have and what's ready to harvest, they take to the skies. One of the pieces of technology that we use is mapping all of our fields from the air. So we can see above us the plane he works with you. So we contract him to fly all of our lettuce so that we know exactly how many plants we've got in the field. If we need to produce more lettuce for next week, this data helps us because we know exactly how much lettuce we've got available, but also the different colours represent the different sizes of lettuce. So we can spot where the bigger lettuce are, so we can go to there first, letting the other lettuce grow to become that size afterwards. This aerial scanning not only tells them what they have available for harvest, they can also troubleshoot areas that aren't growing so well got hammers that can see things that the human eye can't. We can see how well the, the lettuce is performing in different areas so that a grower can then go to that precise area to change it. Maybe they, in this red area here, for example, they put more fertilizer and that crop will grow more healthy than it was before. But doesn't the farmer just walk up and down his field? The farmers do walk up and down the field, but they haven't got supercomputers in their head. They can't remember every single lettuce that they see, whereas with this data, we can sort them. Their supercomputer joins up information about what crop they have ready to harvest with predicted demand. They are constantly making adjustments to their planning to make sure supply can meet changing sales. All this information and all this technology means they know exactly, and I mean down to every single lettuce head, what they've got ready to meet demand. But they've still got to get the lettuces out of the ground and onto the supermarket shelves as fast as possible. 
To respond to rapid changes in demand, G's need to be able to harvest the lettuce quickly. And the best way is this. A state-of-the-art super harvester with a built-in packing shed. <laughs> this is fabulous. It's like a little factory in a Indeed, field. that's it. That's the idea. It's a pack house in the field. What happens when it goes up there? Once the lettuce are picked out of the field, they're taken upstairs so that they can be packed fresh. This lettuce we're packing now could be on the supermarket shelf within 24 hours. I want to pick some. I want sure, to pick okay, some. so let's have a go. Uh, if we can take one of those lettuce where you show are. Show me, show me. So, we're taking out the outer leaves, cutting down with the knife, and then that's ready to go on there. Give me, give me, give me. Down with the knife. Perfect. Ready to go. And a very nice hat to boot. I think I prefer my hat, but you, know, you can keep that one. <laughs> <laughs> like you that? See, that's perfect. There we go. Of course it's perfect. I was a greengrocer for 20 years. That I think it's true. a shame you're getting rid of the outer leaves. So the outer leaves are mainly for the protection of the head. They're not as tasty, not as nutritious, don't have as much moisture in, but they make sure that we can prevent pests and weather damage occurring. These are not heavy, but this is actually still back-breaking work. It is very hard work. Yeah. It is. So this is just the way we have traditionally have harvested the lettuces, but now what you're doing is packing them straight away. All in this as it rolls across the field. That's it, exactly. So everything from the field is ready to go out to the shop. I keep forgetting to move forward, and it keeps <laughs> on hitting me in the back. It's because they're cutting so quickly. Come on, come on, let's, let's have a go. look upstairs. This is just one of 13 harvesters they use to cut 50,000 lettuces a day from soil to shelf in under 24 hours. This speed is crucial because a lettuce only lasts six or seven days, but it also means they can have thousands in stores as soon as the sun shines. We're now in the upstairs of our mobile pack house where the crop has been freshly cut out of the ground, wrapped automatically in plastic and put in a box ready to go out to the retailers. They are moving really fast. So, yeah, and even in the summer we'll cut 24 seven, so we'll have a day shift and a night shift. What, floodlit? Yeah, so th at the front of the rig where they were cutting will be floodlit, so the people can cut all the way throughout the night. It never stops. It never stops, but in the summer that's the highest demand, the peak demand of lettuce, so we need to be able to get it out for our retailers. You would never know, would you, gazing at this field, that so much was happening behind these curtains? Definitely not, no. It's funny, because to me a lettuce looks like such a gentle thing. This is a real hive of industry, isn't it? It is, it is. Come on, come on. Harvesting the lettuces fast is not the last challenge facing G's because those thousands of lettuces will need replacing. So, planting enough seedlings at the right time is a massive technical task. To manage it, data on what's being harvested combined with forecasted future trends is fed into computers in the greenhouses. Then they prepare exactly the right number of seedlings to produce fully grown lettuces for the next batch. Trouble is, in winter it takes six months to grow full grown lettuces, but in summer it's just a third of that time. Just one of the many things to complicate the computer's calculations. We can also have problems with pests, we can have problems with disease, we can have problems with changing soil type in the field. So we're trying to then develop the model further by adding all these different data points in, which gives us more armour to make sure that we are producing the right amount for our customers. They have hundreds of thousands of seedlings stored in chillers, ready to plant the moment they need them. And, once planted, to give the seedlings the best chance to grow, a robot shifts them around in the greenhouse to the warmest parts. The robot enables us to take a lot of workload off the people who are working here mean that they can then go into jobs that are more strategic and they're thinking about planning and what we need to be sending out to plant outside. But that's not all. Because when they're needed, the young plants are sent out to the fields where an automatic, driverless tractor directed by GPS plants them at a rate of around 30 every second in perfectly straight lines. As you can see, this planter can plant many rows at once, and this means we can be nimble and reactive towards the changing consumer demands. So we can plant a large volume in one day, meaning that when the weather's good and we need to start getting plants in at a higher rate, we can. Here in East Anglia, we can plant over a million plants of lettuce every day. The 
incredible precision and clever tech behind bringing us a lettuce when we want one is pretty impressive. This is a sophisticated operation, producing tens of millions of lettuce, able to speed up or slow down production in response to the most unpredictable of things, the British weather. With so many players now fighting it out in the world of home delivery groceries, everyone's looking for an edge and the quest to be the quickest is the new front line. The battle to get on board the ultra fast and lucrative market for home delivered groceries is hotting up. Now, whether that's Amazon Prime, Home Run or Quicker, they're all promising the same thing. That's to deliver your groceries to your door within the hour. So far, most of these one-hour services only operate in the major cities, covering just 30% of the population. And they rely on humans and vans to get our food to us fast. Even the smallest traffic jam can mean that their deadline is missed. To beat the traffic, some companies are experimenting with delivery drones, but there are restrictions on where they can fly. So, one smart cookie has come up with a different high-tech solution. Henry Harris Burland is the brains behind a new system of self-driving robots that he thinks can take on the delivery vans. This is a robot that delivers your groceries. I was expecting something a little bit bigger. It needs to not take up too much space on the pavement. It carries about 12 kilograms. It's about three shopping bags of groceries. Okay. And this robot aims to deliver for very, very low cost. This fleet of self-driving robots is the first of its kind in the UK, having been launched in the US and Germany. Here, they're being trialled in a housing estate on the outskirts of Milton Keynes. They're ready to roll into action as soon as an order comes through. It's simply a, an app that you download. Yeah. Let's say we want some strawberries. Yeah. We want some pasta. You add it to your basket. Yeah. Click, set, pick up point and then pay and away we go. The order is received at a local supermarket and packed by hand. He's got his bag of groceries. Yeah. From here, the delivery bot takes over. So how does it know where it's going? So the robot has lots of sensors. Yeah. It's tracked to the nearest inch, so it knows exactly where it is. Right. It's got radars, ultrasonic sensors. It uses computer vision for how it drives autonomously, and that's basically how it knows where it is. It all sounds pretty savvy, but how will our bot actually perform? Oh, hang on. There he is. Oh, there's the there's robot. There's Nigel. So how fast can he go? Four miles an hour. We limit it to four miles an hour max speed for safety. That's how fast I go. Right, what happens if I block him? So what will happen is if the robot cannot get around or if the uh, obstacle stays there, God. it has to find an alternative route. That's very cool. The robot uses tracking technology to navigate, choosing the best routes to minimise junctions and busy streets. It might not be the most direct route, but it should be the safest. Come on, Henry. Keep up, love. leaving me for dead here. But not everyone will be as friendly as I am towards an unaccompanied robot. So, Henry, what happens if someone were to nick it? There's a siren if someone tries to tamper with it. <laughs> It's almost as if we planned that. As soon as the robot goes off track, yeah. we know something's up. So we have to check it immediately and go find out what's happening. What if I was a technical genius and I worked out how to get that tracking device out? If you were to do that, you'd, you'd manage that somehow and you'd manage to open the robot after all that hassle and you'd get some milk and eggs. But how does it deal with a busy junction where it needs to get across in one piece and make sure it's not a danger to others? Only when it's safe, yeah. the robot will cross. And if it's not, the robot might wait for a minute. And if it's been waiting too long, it will ping up to a human operator okay. who will then take control and determine whether it's safe or not to cross. What if someone just shot out of nowhere? We've had situations where someone's running a red light, but it will actually jump back out of the way. So you're saying then 100% safe? Absolutely.
So it's been about an hour since I placed my food order and I have just got a message through on my app saying it has arrived. Hallelujah. Hello. It has arrived. Better manoeuvre than I am in my car. Right, apparently I just have to click on the app and unlock the bad boy. Sounds like it, okay. Et voila, dinner is served. Thank you very much. Robot delivery costs customers a pound and there are plans for the service to be rolled out to selected areas across the country.